This is Justin Case of American Newscape joining our friend and mentor Bob Freeman for part one in our series, How Musical Waters Can Run Deep. Bob joins us to share some musical history, theory, and so much more. Greetings, Bob. Welcome to American Newscape. Justin, it's great to be with you. Bob, both you and your brother Jim have a remarkable and, as far as I'm concerned, a fascinating story of how musical waters ran and even today runs deep in your stories. Let's get this started. Bob, could you please share some of your family's musical history? Of course. Um, it happens with musicians, beginning with the box in the 17th and 18th centuries, where if the parents are musicians and the children become musicians, and their children become musicians, the same thing is really true in other fields as well. You can count, I'm sure, all kinds of people whose parents are physicians and their parents were physicians. It's just a family business, and you get started at that because it's what your parents are interested in. In our case, I'm not quite sure how far the uh, music goes back in the family, but I would guess three or maybe four generations at the least. Uh, my paternal grandfather was born in Birmingham, England, in 1875. In those days, people who owned taverns in the British Midlands were often brass players. In any case, uh, my great-grandfather was a brass player. The tavern went bankrupt, and the family was given a bimodal choice, debtor's prison a la Dickens, or emigrating to Australia. They decided on the latter, and in 1881, set off on a sailing ship uh, for Australia. Uh, a month out, the sailing ship got becalmed for a month. They ran out of food and water, and three of the children died and were buried at sea. But my grandfather and a couple of his siblings made it with the parents to Australia, where he became, by the age of 14, champion cornet player in Australia. When he was in his early 20s, he went back to England, where the action was, and joined the Grenadier Guards Band, without understanding that that was part of the British Army. Uh, when the sergeant at arms told him, here's your rifle, there's a war in South Africa and we're shipping out next Tuesday, uh, my grandfather uh, paid a lot of money he didn't really have to get out of the British Army. Uh, he emigrated to uh, the United States um, uh, and uh, on the way uh, signed up for the 1910-11 uh, tour of John Philip Sousa's band, World Tour, wow. all over the world. They used to complain about the fact that they only got half pay when they were at sea, which was an awful lot of time. But he did that, then he uh, got into trouble uh, with the theater owners in New York City by involving himself in uh, labor disputes uh, that eventually led to the founding of uh, New York local 802, which is why that has such a high number. He was just thrilled at the uh, uh, in 1921 to be offered the trumpet professorship and principal trumpet position at the Eastman School of Music and the Eastman Theater in Rochester, which were just opening at that time. Beautiful new facility. Um, so the whole family moved to Rochester. Can I ask where, a question? I hate to yeah, interrupt sure. you, Bob. That's, now, that's all right. Now, at 14, he was an acclaimed trumpet player. When did he, do you have any clue as to when he picked up the trumpet for the first time? Well, I think it just, like, like my situation, it was something that ran in the family. And it's some, if, if your father played the trumpet, he taught you how to play the trumpet. <laughs> it's, am it's amazing. Okay, I do. Back to the story. So there you are in Rochester. Um... He came to Rochester in 1921. <clears throat> my dad, who was the second of three sons, and those guys were all told by their father, music is a terrible business, it's impossible to make a living, uh, don't go into music. So none of them was allowed to study music until my dad was a senior in high school. Uh, my grandfather knew uh, the conductor of the high school orchestra who needed a double bass player, and so they gave my father double bass, figuring that you know, he was beginning too late to ever be a professional. But he went to the Eastman School, which was now four or five years old, uh, 
graduated from Eastman as the first double day student in 1930, married our mother, who was a very pretty uh, Eastman uh, violinist, brunette, uh, uh, in 1932. Uh, I was born in 1935, Jim in 1939. In 1942, my father played for the Boston Symphony Music Director, Serge Kuzlitsky, who said, you're a great double bass player, I need you in the Boston Symphony. And so within uh, only two or three years, we were able to break contacts with Rochester and move to Boston. Uh, my father's first uh, season as a bass player in the Boston Symphony was 1945-6, uh, and he was there for 22 seasons, advancing from the end of the section uh, to the first chair. Uh, he was a very, very good bass player, even if he only started as a high school senior. <laughs> Uh, he and my mother gave Jim and me uh, a wonderful education of all kinds, not only as musicians, but my mother told the nurse when I was born that I was going to go to Harvard. And in fact, I did <laughs> go to Harvard. And Jim went to Harvard. Uh, eventually, we both got PhDs. I took mine at Princeton, and Jim got his at Harvard. And that qualified us for academic positions. I taught at Princeton, and then I taught at MIT where I made tenure, and then in 1972 I saw that the Eastman School was looking for a director and having learned from my parents what was wrong with the Eastman School all, all of my childhood and teenage years, I wrote a two-page letter uh, and got the job, wow. and that changed my life. It immediately tripled my salary. I was at Eastman for 24 years, then at uh, New England Conservatory as president for a couple of years, and um, then I came to Texas, where I live now. Uh, when I was 65, I thought I was ready to retire, but they offered me the Deanship of Fine Arts, a very good salary, and I did that until I was 71, and then I professed it at a very good salary until I was 80, and now I'm 85. I retired when I was 80. So that's my, that's my whole story. I'm partly pianist, partly conductor. Uh, I used to be a very good oboe player, uh, and I have a PhD in musicology, and I've turned out to be a fairly influential person in the field of musical education. I think that's my story briefly. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably too much. What information can't, what, or I mean, excuse me, what instrument can't you play, Mom? Oh, no, there are all kinds of instruments I can't play. I, never majored in music education where okay. I could teach you a little bit about every every instrument. All right. But I, I was, uh, as a college student, I was a very good professional oboe player. Let's but once I got to the Eastman School, I figured one instrument is enough. And indeed it was. Uh, you know, that's, that's where you talk about your parents' influence, and you talk about growing up in that household. Um, it's, it's remarkable. It, it's it's like your grandfather's musical career, and he was the one that prevented your father from getting involved in music. And Until he was 17 years old. But he didn't. Did he tell your father about how all the girls would chase him once he was a musician? He probably forgot that part. I don't think my grandfather had anything to do with that. <laughs> in fact, all of the girls did chase him. <laughs> <laughs> While he was at the Eastman School, he got into a big row with Howard Hansen, who was the director for 40 years, um, because he played in the Rochester Philharmonic and Civic Orchestras. He had a position at the local radio station, 50,000 watt WHAM, and he was the regular bass player in a silent movie house that uh, called the Regent Theater. And during all of that time, even while he was a student, he made and saved a lot of money. So we always had a fancy car, and the girls liked that. <laughs> Do you remember the car? Uh, no, I, I wasn't there then. <laughs> well, no, but there should be photos floating around. No, that, that's an ex You know, we, we forget, or at least some of us forget, that the silent movies, they had uh, quite... Uh, some of them they had more than pianos in the oh, fancy sure. houses. Ab absolutely, some of them had organs. Uh, in fact, I studied musicology during the 50s and 60s 
with two distinguished historians, both of whom had started their careers as silent movie organists, one at Syracuse and one in Buffalo. Well, it's, it's very it's very heartwarming. You know, I have a passion for music, and to hear how you and your brother were raised, and both of you being extremely acclaimed in, in the music industry, uh, education, as well as composing and playing. Uh, did, did you uh, ever play together with your parents as professionals? Um, the year I think I finished my master's degree at Princeton, we had one family concert at the Gardner Museum on a Sunday afternoon in Boston. And it went very well. And then I tried to persuade my father that we ought to do that in Europe. And he figured out that that was going to cost money instead of make money. So he, he opted out from the beginning. So the rest, the, the rest of us would have been happy to do that. He, he stuck to the Boston Symphony. So we're all baseball fans, um, and Symphony Hall is only a mile from Fenway Park. One of the proud moments in my life was when the Boston Globe uh, published a nice full-page article about my father and Dick Gernert, who in those days was the first baseman for the Red Sox, and my father was the first baseman for the Pops. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> um, that's interesting. Now, when you played together as a family, were mom and dad critical, or were they... Uh... Oh, they insisted if you're going to do anything in public, then you've got to be ready. Um, you've got to be prepared. And you've got to play well. I mean, there's, there's no point in doing that sort of thing unless you're going to make a good impression on somebody. A uh, big chance I had was in my sophomore year at college. I was called by the, the uh, personnel manager of the Boston Opera House and said, Sadler's Wells Ballet is coming in next week, and we don't have a second oboe English horn player. And I said, well, I'd love to play, but I don't have an English horn, so I guess not. And the guy said, ah, it's all right. He said, we'll get the guy from the show to double on English horn, and you can just play second. So I said, fine. Uh, I got there half an hour early, and the uh, boss man said, kid, we got a problem. Uh, the, the first oboe won't double on English horn. He'll play second and double on English horn. Are you up for playing first? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's just what my, my father was always talking about. Is, I mean, the answer had to be yes, but you had to be ready. So what are we playing tonight? Tchaikovsky Swan Lake, <laughs> which which starts out with a big with a big oboe solo. Said you up for that? And I said, yeah, I got a couple of good reads. Let's try it. And I did well. And they offered me the job of being the regular oboe player of the Boston Opera House, where my first job when I was a sophomore was uh, playing for six weeks uh, in King and I with the old runner. Wow. Wow. Who, who? I learned from that that it's sort of boring doing the same thing every night. Yeah, but you were in the pit. so. Who, who? Well, that made it possible for me to study German word lists <laughs> until the next number was ready. Yeah. <laughs> you could have made a good trombone. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Who? Do you remember who's co-starred with uh, Yul Brenner? Uh, Gertrude Lawrence, I think. Oh, okay. What, what a what a wonderful memory that must have been. That 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 piece was brand new. I mean, it had just played itself out in New York, and it came to Boston for six weeks. You know, my my limited musical career, I I love being in the pit because. Um, you just you were right in the middle of everything. So. Anyway, I had a lot of experiences like that uh, as a college student. But I got very interested in the piano, and I played a couple of piano concertos at Pops. Uh, and I oh, was the regular pianist for the Boston Symphony, the guy who became the concertmaster. And I played ten recitals with my mother at the Gardner Museum, uh, in which there was one of the ten Beethoven sonatas for violin and piano on each of the programs. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity. Like, I'm guessing your parents were wonderful musical mentors 
as you and your brother have both become, correct? Well, I would, what I would say about my parents wasn't just that they saw to it that we, Jim and I, both had pretty good musical educations, which we did, <clears throat> but we, they also made sure that we had very good general educations. I mean, they insisted that I go to a place called Milton Academy, <clears throat> which was one of the leading New England prep schools then and now. Small classes, big homework assignments every night. And so if you get up at 6.30 in the morning and uh, go get the bus, which took 45 minutes to get to Milton, uh, 15 miles away, classes until 3 p.m., after which there was enforced uh, intramural sports. I was never very good at that. So it didn't matter. I had to do it anyway. <coughs> The bus went home at 5.15, dinner for half an hour with parents, brother, and then you had uh, until 11 o'clock to study and or practice seven days a week, which meant there was no time for getting into trouble of any kind. You just, you know, I've been working 18 hours a day for as long as I can remember. Yeah. Even today, how many hours a week did you practice? Oh, probably not that much because I had to, you know, I had Latin and chemistry and yeah. history and math and all of that to look after at the very highest level yeah. in small classes. <laughs> so I, I practiced one instrument or the other uh, for an hour and a half a night. Okay. That's about all you could get in. Okay. Um, and did you and your parents have any other interests as other than music and education? Well, if you talk to the gym, uh, you'll see that he had a very close relationship with my father uh, doing things like fishing and hiking and gardening which I never got into there was no time to do that but he my, my, my adolescence was entirely studying music and everything else I'm sure I and, I and I would imagine you still hear your mother playing the violin in the recesses of your mind quite often course yeah what a gift that is okay let's let's talk about the CD project how did you decide upon these three composers whose work is represented on the CD you're putting together yeah um, I think it was my brother's idea that we ought to commission several pieces in memory of our parents and the, the first one I was involved with uh, was Kevin Putz's uh, Red Snapper Quintet your parents, maybe should, uh, your listeners should maybe know, first of all, that there's a famous piece by Schubert, written in the 1820s, called the Trout Quintet. He had written a song uh, about the trout, die Forelle, in German, uh, and then he wrote a whole uh, big piece of 40 minutes for five instruments, violin, viola, cello, double bass, my dad's instrument, piano. Oh, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I commissioned a companion piece for the Trout Quintet for bass players to play in memory of my father? I was deaning at Texas, and Kevin Putz, who had uh, taken two degrees from the Eastman School, and in the meantime has won the Pulitzer Prize, was a member of the UT faculty. So I asked him, what would it, what would it take? How much would it cost me for you to write a... Uh, uh, a quintet in your style uh, with the same instruments as Schubert used. And he said 20 grand. Wow. Well, my wife and I put 7,500 into it. And since I was dean and Kevin Putz was a faculty member, I could take 7,500 out of funds of the dean's office, which left me $5,000 short. And then I thought, well, this is uh, uh, a companion piece for Schubert's. Trout Quintet, I asked my fundraising director in the college who owned the best seafood restaurant in Texas. And she said, well, that's an alumnus named Paul Guido. Uh, he runs something called Guido's at the Seawall in Galveston. Why don't you ask him? So I took him out for lunch and gave him a copy of the, of the Schubert recording and said uh, that a good way to advertise his restaurant 
uh, would be for him to give me $5,000. And while I ch chose the instruments and the composer, uh, uh, he could choose the pitch <laughs> for five grand. And, and he called me back the next day and said, I talked about it with my wife. This is a great idea. It's going to be called the Red Snapper Quintet. Red Snapper is Texas' state fish. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the best Red Snapper I ever had was in El Paso, Texas. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's how that one came into being. Uh, the second piece, uh, Romance, by a lady named Andrea Clarefield, uh, was on a program that my brother had conducted with his orchestra in Philadelphia, and it was called Romance, and he made that in memory of our mother. And then we thought, well, great American composer and musician was Gunther Schiller. Uh, he was one of my predecessors at New England Conservatory. Uh, he was a great composer, a fine conductor. Uh, he had been in charge of the summer program at Tanglewood for quite a long time. Um, he was, at the age of 17, the principal horn player at the Metropolitan Opera. Gunther Schiller was like Leonard Bernstein, a, a man who could do everything. And so we asked Gunther Schiller, who was a great admirer of, of our father, uh, and he said, yeah. So we paid Gunther, I think, $7,500. He didn't need the money, I think. Uh, uh, so he gave us a very uh, inexpensive price to write a two piano sonata, which my brother and I recorded as the third piece on, on that album. Uh, both Putz and Schiller are among the American composers who have won the Pulitzer Prize. So both leading composers both wrote terrific pieces, and Andrea's piece is terrific, too. Wow. Um, <laughs> just amazing. Can, can you tell us about the Orchestra 2001 and how you happened to happened to how you happened to find it in 1988? Uh, uh, that's Jim's orchestra. Okay. I didn't find you. That's a question you should ask him when you interview him. I will ask him that question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you? Well, well, let's let's move to something. Uh, so this is a wonderful tribute to your parents and uh, it sounds like a lot of the industry came together for you to help put it together which that's heartwarming in itself uh, but well it, you know it takes money to make that kind of thing happen but we raised the money Eastman School put in some money and the University of Texas put in some money <laughs> we had a good time doing that we got some grants from this place and that place and, and we also coughed up some money from our own pockets and Red Snapper was more <laughs> Red Snapper was one. Yeah. Okay. Hey, could, hey, touch on you. Touch on the act, activity you were remembering singing Christmas Carol together as a family. Well, that that's something that started the first year we were in Boston. My we moved to Boston so that my father could play in the Boston Symphony, and my mother was having a hard time catching on as a professional violinist in a much bigger city than Rochester. And she was uh, invited to play um, in, a, in a musical show at the Colonial Theater, uh, which started rehearsals on Christmas Day. The name of the show was In Gay New Orleans, which you've never heard of because it closed after two nights. But that meant that my dad and Jim and I had to spend Christmas alone together without our mother there and uh, in a search for what shall we do now my father had the idea that we should learn half a dozen Christmas carols and we should invite the kid next door to join us and so we went around the neighborhood doing that and it was fun and then the next year my mother uh, came with us and pretty soon another family from the Boston Symphony my father's friend Willis Page joined us, and it became more serious business that we would uh, go not only to, to the homes on our street of our neighbors, but we would uh, sing it over at Milton Academy, and we would sing at homes of Boston Symphony members. Uh, I think the most, uh, <laughs> and of course people would invite us in and give us a drink. So that by the time you got to 11 or 12 that <laughs> night, everybody was more or less looped. No, that was antifreeze. 
<laughs> right. But, but the most exciting uh, memory I have from that activity was that my father, as the principal bass in the Boston Pops, was friends with Arthur Fiedler. Wow. And it was said that Arthur Fiedler had married a Christian lady, and so might he might be uh, celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve. I didn't, we didn't know, but we'd go and see. So my father backed up our old Studebaker to find a parking place in Brookline, and in doing so, uh, hit the lamppost, uh, and the lamppost shattered glass all over our car, <laughs> all over the street, because uh, we, we sort of busted it. And uh, I think it was Jim who said, let's get out of here. And we did. <laughs> my father told Arthur uh, subsequently what had happened, and Fiedler had said to my father, he said, I always wondered what how, how that lap got broken on the street light outside. He said, I saw the car uh, that did that, and he said, I called the police. And they chase you, but they didn't catch us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, family so we had, we, we had lots of, of fun adventures doing that kind of thing. Well, before we leave, Bob, are there any other thoughts you'd care to share with us today? Well, what I've been principally involved with uh, is changing the way in musicians have been educated and trained. Uh, when I got into the business of directing American music schools, um, they taught you how to play your instrument. And they did it pretty well at places like Juilliard and Curtis, Eastman, Indiana. But what I said is that young musicians ought to learn a whole lot more in music school than just how to play your instrument. Um, you're 18 when you start as a freshman in a music school, and if you're good enough, maybe you might decide to be a composer or a conductor or somebody like Leonard Bernstein who could do all of those things. Uh, but in any case, we ought to train you uh, so that you can read and write and speak as well as play because it's going to be your responsibility to help develop audiences. And I guess I'm the person in the United States who was given the most credit for putting that in motion. Uh, if you and your listeners go to YouTube, and uh, I just finished a book with Leonard Slatkin about the future of American orchestras, and I'd refer you to the two-minute speeches which Leonard is excellent at giving. Uh, have a look at uh, three different examples. The first is Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. The second is the Tchaikovsky Fourth. And the third is Stravinsky's version of Happy Birthday to You. Uh, in each of those two-minute speeches, Leonard sticks to under two minutes, because if you give a five-minute speech or a three-minute speech, the audience has gotten impatient to hear the music. But if you can say something in two minutes, which is articulate and well expressed, and which leads the audience to the music, you've really got something. That, and something that I helped get started at Eastman during the 90s, uh, which is called the Institute for Musical Leadership, which half of the enrollment there is now involved with, where students learn uh, to think not uh, about what music was like 20 years ago when their teachers uh, were professional musicians, but where music will be 30 years from now, when they're going to be professional, if they are going to be. Yeah. And that then raises all kinds of questions about how can I form a special festival in Alfred, New York, and where do I get funding for that? And how do I persuade the provost of USC to hire a string quartet when one of the members of the string quartet, if he's older than the others, uh, may age more quickly than the others. Then what do you do? Questions of that kind. Well, it's it's fascinating. So you've lived a life laying the groundwork that goes on today. Yeah, well, and, and getting uh, people much younger than I am to uh, follow in my trail. Yeah. Thinking about the future is the main thing. Well, that I think that's that's what my life's been mostly about. Well, Bob, let me... I'll tell you one. I'll okay. tell you one last story. We could, and uh, in 1979, <clears throat> my late wife and I were watching the Pittsburgh Pirates play Baltimore in the World Series, 
and a wonderful black guy named Louis Stargell hit a home run in each of the last three games. The television people were in his face with, hey, you won the World Series, to which he said, in a really wonderful voice, you ever try to play baseball by yourself? My team won the World Series. Uh, I thought, geez, that guy is not only has a great voice and is a great hitter, but he's smart and nice. So I dreamed up immediately the idea of having an Eastman composer named Joseph Schwantner to write a piece or narrator an orchestra on text by Dr. King. And I asked Willie then to be the narrator in the first performance, which took place with the Eastman Philharmonia and Willie Stargell uh, at the Kennedy Center. And we played Philadelphia and Carnegie Hall. We did an East Coast tour. Uh, and he was great. He did a terrific job. But I'll tell you the story now that I've given you the background of uh, the second night out. We're at the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, which in those days was where the Philadelphia Orchestra played. <clears throat> and some guy from the press got past my security guards and said to Stargell, this is a this is a temple of high art. This is where Serkin plays the piano and Isaac Stern plays the violin. Given how little you must know about classical music, aren't you sort of shy and embarrassed to appear as a soloist here? To which Willie said, is Steve Carlton here? <laughs> and the guy, the famous pitcher for Philadelphia, oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the, the newspaper guy said, well, I, I don't know. And Willie said, listen, if Steve Carlton were here, I'd be shy and embarrassed. He struck me out 23 times last season alone. <laughs> but then he said, I've been thinking about the question you raise in some ways appearing as a concert artist at the Academy of Music uh, is like playing baseball, and in some ways it's not. He said the two are like each other in the sense <clears throat> that in both roles you wear absolutely silly costumes. But he said they're unlike each other and that if I hit into three double plays and strike out three times in the same game, first people boo, and then they throw rocks and batteries at you. Uh, but he said when we appeared at the Kennedy Center last night, uh, the conductor said, if you don't do well, I'm sure you will do well, and he did. He said, whatever you do, you got to embrace me warmly and act as though you've just swallowed three canaries. That uh, then you go around and, and, and hug the young women in the front rows of the string sections. Uh, and so Willie said, well, the baseball audience knows what I've, what's going on. He said, I have the impression that a classical music audience doesn't know what's going on. They clap when you come on before you do anything, and they clap when you finish, <laughs> whether you've done well or not. <laughs> uh, that, that was Willie, who subsequently nominated me to be baseball commissioner, but I didn't get it. <laughs> I, I actually met him in the early 80s, so he was a yep. remarkable man. Yep. Okay, thank you for leaving us with that, Bob. Um, this That's is, a cheerful story. It is. It is. <laughs> This has been Justin Case and Bob Freeman sharing a beautiful perspective on how musical waters can run deep. Thanks for joining us. Remember additional information and links provided in this video is read more. And come back and listen to Bob's brother, Jim, as we do part two of this series. Please be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected and please stand back. We are not sure how much bigger this channel is going to get. Okay. Okay, thank you.